good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here today. My name is Giuseppe D'Angelo. Uh, today I would like to tell you a little bit about uh, uh, optimization techniques when it comes to rendering of Qt Quick 2 applications. Uh, just two words about me. Who am I? Why I'm here to tell you about this. Uh, I work at KDAB. I'm a developer. I'm a trainer. I've been using Qt for a very, very long time, uh, and especially I work in the areas of Qt Core, Qt Quick, Qt 3D rendering. So I think I'm a little bit qualified at telling you something about these particular technologies. Uh, the thing I want to discuss with you today uh, has to do with the performance of Qt Quick 2 rendering. Uh, in the sense that when we talk about Qt Quick performance, uh, we can talk about many, many angles, many, many aspects, uh, C++ performance or JavaScript performance. Uh, I want to focus, of course, because I have only one hour, about rendering performance and uh, specifically about the, run the runtime performance of Qt Quick when using OpenGL. That's not the complete story. There is also another story about rendering performance. Uh, I gave you a sample of that yesterday during my lightning talk. There is something to be said also about uh, asset conditioning, offline processing, but I'm not touching that today right now, okay? So when it comes to performance in rendering, what do we mean? Well, typically, the obvious, draw faster. Uh, however, how do we achieve that? Uh, well, we can go about that in different angles, in different ways. Uh, a simpler way of drawing faster is drawing the same things but in less time, okay, so optimize how you draw things. You can also decide to draw fewer things. That's also a good strategy to be faster. You may decide to draw simpler things. So if you have something very complicated to render, you may trade the quality for speed, or you can even trade the memory for speed. Sometimes you have techniques like caching that allow you to uh, use a little more memory, but uh, gain some speed when you render. Uh, other concerns are also important. Uh, for instance, use less resources, typically memory. That also is very important. Again, I gave you an idea about, an idea about that yesterday during my lightning talk. Uh, or other stuff like improving your battery consumption, improving your power, improve, reduce drawing latency. Those are all important aspects when it comes to performance rendering. So uh, this talk will look like this. I will try to give you a few uh, good advices around the Qt Quick development. So I've divided this talk in a few chapters. The first one, the simpler uh, approach about uh, how to improve your performance is about detect and avoid overdraw inside your Qt Quick scenes. What is overdraw? What do I mean by that? Uh, well, it is, it is about this simple idea that the easiest way to draw, to be faster, is to draw less, draw less contents. In the ideal world, we would like that for Qt Quick to draw all and only the elements the user can see, right? I create a Qt Quick scene, and I want Qt Quick to render only the things that the user can see. However, that is not what Qt Quick does. Qt Quick does another thing. Qt Quick will draw every item which has the visible property set to true. And that is, generally speaking, a superset of what the user can possibly see. Why? Because Qt Quick is going to draw elements that the user cannot see. For instance, elements that are completely out of bounds, elements that are completely obscured by opaque elements stuck on top, uh, elements that are clipped, and so on. Right? There are various things that you can do that make Qt Quick do work for nothing. And uh, typically speaking, the, uh, the obscured ones is actually the worst because uh, you paid the most for that, and that, that, that tends to happen the whole, all the time. The thing is, Qt Quick does not implement any optimization to avoid overdraw. Qt Quick itself will simply render every visible item. Uh, there are techniques in OpenGL that would allow you to not do that. There's techniques that perhaps you have heard of, something called Z filling or frustum culling or occlusion culling or other similar things. Qt Quick does not do any of that, which means that we as developers must manually tell Qt Quick please do not draw this item because you, the user cannot see it, right? We must set visible to false, pretty much, to each and every item that the user cannot see at any moment. 
Uh, mal doing it manually can be tedious for, for that reason, using built-in elements, uh, try to reuse stuff like stack view or swipe view is a good idea. Do not reinvent those elements from scratch because those, el those elements do the right thing. Sometimes people, however, since QtQuick is so simple to use, reinvent these elements from scratch and forget about doing this. How do I detect if I am overdrawing in the first place? Uh, the easiest way possible is to run your application into Gamma Ray and switch it to overdraw visualization mode, and you're going to visualize if you're overdrawing. Uh, if you don't use Gamma Ray, there are another couple of options that you can use. You can ex export an uh, environment variable for the same effect. Uh, the difference is that uh, if you export the environment variable, you're going to have your entire application running in uh, overdraw visualization. So then you need to navigate your application without seeing your application, which is not so fun. I'm going to explain that in a second. Or if you want, if you're good at OpenGL, just run an, an OpenGL debugger, an OpenGL profiler, and look for statistics that look like overdraw or something called the Z complexity, meaning how many times a given pixel was, was rendered, uh, or cold primitives and so on. Uh, OpenGL profilers will give you these numbers per every frame so you can get an idea of how much overdrawing I'm doing. So how do I do that? Well, I have an example to, of showing this in action. I actually have many examples. But this one is the one I want to run. Sorry, let me actually open the source code. Yeah. Uh, it is a very simple thing. Uh, I've got uh, a rectangle as a background. And uh, uh, when I click on it, I'm going to open a side menu, which is sitting on the side of the application. And at the same time, I'm going to obscure the main content of my application so that the user can focus on the menu, right? For simplicity, here everything is a rectangle, but uh, please bear with me. Imagine that actually you have lots and lots of complicated content in your application. So when I run this, I see that. And then when I click here, this menu on the side opens and the main contents gets obscured. And I click again, the menu goes away, right? So this looks simple in principle, but actually what I'm doing here is a lot of overdraw, uh, and I can visualize that in action by running Gamma Ray. It's this thing here, yeah. So if I go inside, oh, sorry, stop it. Okay, if I go inside Gamma Ray, so now Gamma Ray is now attached to this application, uh, what I can do is click, I think it's this button right here. No, sorry, this button right here. That says visualize the overdraw. And when you do that, uh, the visualization of your application is going to be very different in the sense that uh, Qt Quick is going to uh, draw the 3D structure of your scene, meaning you are, you are able to see if there is something on top of something else, if there is something out of bounds, and so on. So if I now click that and I switch back to my application, I see that. That is if you want the structure of my application in terms of my Qt Quick scene in terms of 3D content. And as you can clearly see, there is something on the outside of my application which is being rendered even though it's completely invisible. See that? It's that thing on the side. Uh, if I actually open the menu, so I click here, now you see that there, is, there are three things stacked on top of each other and there is a thing in the middle which is completely obscuring something behind it. So why is that something behind it visible? Right. I'm rendering something potentially very expensive to render for no good reason. Okay? And as I told you, Qt Quick will render everything because right now everything is visible. Okay? So it's very easy. Uh, the advantage of running, into Q, into, uh, into running this application into Gamma Ray is that I can switch this on and off. So I can actually navigate through my application until I reach the screen that I want to debug. If you just export the environment variable, your application is going to look like this the whole time, which is not so practical if you need want to actually use the application to find the screen that you want to debug. That's the reason why I'm using Gamma Ray right now. Okay. Uh, sorry, what happened here? Why, did, why I'm at the beginning? Uh, sorry, there is something not working again? Good. Oh, sorry, I see why. Okay, here we go. Uh, right, that was it. Next topic, uh, consider caching items that are expensive to render. Uh, what does caching mean? It means the obvious. Uh, let's trade some memory for speed. Okay. Uh, the thing is this, that uh, uh, I could have some elements inside my cute quick scene that are very expensive to render. 
And usual suspects are the shader effects that you have in Qt Quick. You can very easily apply a shadow, a blur, an opacity mask, a colorization effect on top of a Qt Quick item. Those elements are usually kind of expensive to render. Okay. Uh, so what is, what is the problem with them? Uh, the problem here is this, is that OpenGL, which is being used by Qt Quick, does not support partial updates. And by that I mean that every time anything changes in my scene, I need to redraw everything, including these elements which are very expensive to render, and including, uh, even if these elements have not changed at all in the meanwhile, okay? So you could have a very nice UI, and perhaps you got a small blinking icon in a corner that the blinking icon is causing the entirety of your UI to be redrawn at every frame, including the parts that are expensive to render. So maybe you don't want to do that. Maybe you figure out that why is my application using so much uh, power, so much GPU? Uh, so you may want to cache them. So first and foremost, how do I detect if I have some of these elements? How do I figure out if I have something which is expensive to render? Uh, there isn't uh, like a, a, an easy way. The best way is run your application inside an OpenGL tracer, uh, get a log, and then try to understand how many draw calls I'm making in there, right? Uh, there are plenty, there is plenty of uh, OpenGL tracers. I typically use those through Insight for NVIDIA and API Trace, which is cross-platform. Uh, but typically, I, I'm, going, I'm going to see inside the, those logs that in order to draw one element, I'm doing dozens of draw calls, right? For instance, in order to apply a blur, uh, the blur effect is particularly sophisticated because it, it's going to do several draws of, this ele of the same element at the different resolutions, try to achieve this blur effect. Okay, so once, I've did, once I found that I have something which is expensive to render, how can I fix this, uh, I may decide, let's cache the results. And by cache, I mean, let's like take a screenshot of the element, and then the next time I need to repaint it, I simply delete the screenshot. I don't need to repaint it from scratch. Qt Quick has built-in support for all of this. That's very good news. Uh, the only thing I need to set is that property, which is called layer enabled true. It's non-obvious to find. You need to know that that property does this. Uh, but anyhow, if you enable that, then uh, uh, your element is going to be, again, screenshotted, and, you, and uh, every time you need to redraw it, you're going to use it from the screenshot. Unless the element itself changes. If, if the element itself changes, then the cache gets discarded, so the next time you're going to redraw it, and everything is fine. So let me show this again. I should have another example for this. I uh, believe it's this one here. So this is, in principle, the, what I was talking about. What do I have here is some blurred text, some more blurred text, and so on. Got plenty of special effects in there. This is very, very easy to, to do in QML. And what I have at the bottom is a small rotating element. And the point is that since that element is changing, I'm redrawing everything. At every frame, I'm reapplying the blur on all of that text. And that's, generally speaking, expensive to do. So a simpler way to, to fix this is uh, enable, enabling this property, layer enabled, to true, so that I'm going to screenshot the blurred text, and then every time I need to draw it, I'm not going to reapply the blur effect. I'm going to just use the screenshot. So I simply do that, and I run again. Uh, yeah, sorry. And the result looks exactly the same, except now it's much, much cheaper to render, right? So it's very easy. Uh, the only warning or the only caveat that, that this thing has, uh, consider caching bigger elements, uh, not each and every smaller element that is expensive to render. That's because this caching mechanism itself has a cost. Uh, so there is a trade-off that you need to find somewhere. For instance, if you have like a menu bar full of buttons and each button has like a shadow applied on it, so you may think that each and every button is expensive to render, so let's cache every button. That's probably a bad idea. It would be a better idea to cache like the entire menu bar, okay? So consider caching the root of trees containing many elements and not each and every element itself, right? In the example of, yes, 
I'm taking questions in the end. Could you take a note? Uh, I got slide numbers at the bottom. So if you want to just ask a question in the end with the microphone, is that fine? OK. Uh, yes, yes. So the question was about the element changing has to be outside. Well, that was just my demonstration that uh, that element is enough to cause a redraw of the entire scene. So I'm not caching that one, I'm caching the text. But in this case, I'm actually caching the whole, the three texts in one go, because perhaps they all go together. Okay. Next topic, uh, let's understand OpenGL. Uh, okay, this is kind of a heavy topic, and of course I don't have time right now to, to explain the entirety of the OpenGL API to you, so let's go for the flight level 400 overview of OpenGL. What is OpenGL and why is it important to understand how it works? Uh, so OpenGL itself, in case you don't know, it's uh, an open specification for 3D graphics programming. It's a very old API, comes from the 80s. Uh, it's got uh, several evolutions and several like, reboots along the way. The reason why we use OpenGL today is because it allows us to use the computational power of your GPUs. That's why we want to use it, because we want to draw fast. And uh, the good news is Qt itself has always had excellent support for, for OpenGL. That's amongst the reasons why Qt Quick itself is drawn using OpenGL. What is OpenGL all about? Uh, OpenGL is about defining a very complex state machine. That's what OpenGL does. Uh, this state machine is built around a data flow processing pipeline. And what do I mean by that is that there is a definition inside the specification of a way of process data in multiple steps. Uh, you've got various sorts of inputs inside this data flow pipeline. And the idea is that you start from these inputs, you apply several stages of processing, and the results are pixels on your screen. Okay? That's the overview that we are interested in. Uh, that's uh, the same image zoomed in. As you can see, there are many, many stages in there. Inputs come from the top of the pipeline, usually in the form of some sort of data buffers containing arbitrary data. And then you apply various stages of processing, and the output is something you see on the screen. Now, the important story for us is this. Uh, in order to draw something in OpenGL, we must set up this machine before we can do anything at all. Okay? We must set up a lot, a lot of state inside this big state machine before we are able to run it. This state has various forms, because there is a lot of it, uh, usually inputs to the pipeline, and these inputs have, have, must have certain forms. Usually, uh, there are vertex buffer objects you must specify what certain stages should do. Usually there are a couple in there which, are, which you must provide, the vertex and the fragment shader stages. You may also provide ancillary data, like uh, images, textures, uniforms, and so on. And you have also countless extra switches and knobs to fine tune the behavior of that pipeline. For instance, uh, apply depth testing, or don't, apply face culling, or don't, and so on. Only when we have done all of that, we can think of drawing something. Okay, there's this immense setup that happens beforehand, and then we draw something. And the moral lesson here is this, is that while we draw something, we cannot change the state that we have set up. State never changes during a draw command, only between them. In other words, I need to set up everything, draw, and then if I, draw, I want to draw something else, I need to change the state, and then draw to something else. Right? Uh, this practically meaning means this, that if I want to draw multiple objects, so I got a cute quick scene, I got a rectangle and an image. Those are different objects. I want to draw them. What I must do is something like this. I need to set up the OpenGL machinery in a given way to draw one of my objects, draw, then go back, change the state of my machinery, draw again. Right? There is another way to see this, which is you cannot draw different objects together if they require different state. Because you cannot change state during a draw call. Okay? So you must stop, change state, and then draw again. And why is this, is this important? Well, it is important because we need to understand what is the performance of such a complicated machine. Because the performance of OpenGL directly affects the rendering performance of, of Qt Quick. So how do, we how do we understand the performance of such complicated thing? There is a very easy uh, analogy 
that I usually use when I give trainings around these topics. It's very easy to grasp. I usually compare the performance of OpenGL to the performance of a high-speed train. That's an ETR 1000. It's the fastest train we ever run in Italy. So what are the performance characteristics of a high-speed train? Right? And we'll find that they pretty much match the ones that OpenGL has. So good news. A high-speed train, it's fast, runs over 300 kilometers an hour, and it's able to transport hundreds of people at, at that speed. Okay, it's very good for that. OpenGL, well, since it harnesses the power of your GPU, it is indeed able to draw hundreds of thousands of primitives per second. Right? They're both very, very fast at what they do. However, they don't come without constraints. Trains cannot be used to simply to travel from point A to point B. You need to prepare them before they, you're able to make a train travel between two points, right? You need to lay down tracks. You need to electrify those tracks. You can't just go anywhere you want with a train, right? That's the same story with OpenGL. You can't draw anything you want. You need to massage your data in a way that OpenGL understands. For instance, your data must look like triangles. OpenGL does not understand more than that, right? Also, you need to set up all the state that OpenGL needs before you can draw anything at all, just like trains. Yeah, you can't just tell it, draw this complicated 3D mesh. It doesn't work like that. And for the bad news, or for the performance-related news, a high-speed train like that has a lot of inertia. Yeah, they take forever to speed up and slow down, and that's the reason why they don't stop every five minutes, right? They stop only in bigger cities. Because stopping a high-speed train very often is a no-go. Well, OpenGL has a similar thing. OpenGL has lots of inertia, double quotes, of course, as well. Uh, meaning that there are technological reasons why OpenGL has inertia, because GPUs are complicated to set up, there is a latency involved, and so on. Meaning, stopping the OpenGL pipeline too often is bad for performance. Right? You, what you want to do is let OpenGL draw as much as possible within changing state, so that you can keep the pipeline running. <coughs> And the thing is, as since what we just saw, we must stop OpenGL every time we need to change any part of OpenGL state. Every time we need to change anything, like which object to render, because that implies changing buffers to read from, which texture to use, what are your opacity settings, or your blending settings, or your clipping settings, or your shader being used. Every time you need to change any of that, you have to stop OpenGL, right? And that's bad, because having too many changes is bad for performance. So we don't want that to happen. In the ideal world, what we, what we would do is that we would set up OpenGL in a way that it can render a huge number of things without changing state. Because that means keep the pipeline running all the time. Yep. This is very complicated, however, to do in practice. Uh, there are a couple of factors for that. Uh, the first factor is that cute quick rendering is, if you want, general purpose. We're not building a specialized game engine that just needs to run one specific use case. Okay, so cute quick cannot foresee all possible use cases and therefore it cannot be as fast as it could be. And the second reason why, uh, why cute quick cannot do this is because the actual renderer is using kind of a very old OpenGL technology called OpenGL ES2. Uh, that's old. Uh, modern OpenGL versions actually add a lot, a lot of API with the idea of never stopping the pipeline. A huge deal of so-called modern OpenGL is all about not stopping the pipeline. So they have added all those things that I've listed over there, instance of drawing, uniform buffer objects. Those are all technologies added into OpenGL with the sole purpose of not stopping the pipeline or stopping it as few times as possible. So with this in mind, how do we make cute, quick, minimize state changes in OpenGL? Well, QtQuick uses OpenGL in order to draw a scene. Uh, this means that when I have a QtQuick scene containing like an image, some text, and so on, 
these elements get converted into OpenGL commands, right? However, the mapping between elements in my scene and OpenGL commands is not one-to-one, -one, if you want, because that will generate a ton of draw commands, right? Typically, scenes are very complicated. I got many, many objects. Uh, I don't want to do that. I don't want to generate draw commands for each item. Qtquick does something much, much smarter because the way Qtquick renders the scene uh, goes through an intermediate data structure called the scene graph. What happens under the hood is this, is that uh, each and every element of your scene is going to be used in order to build this data structure. Okay, the Qtquick renderer is going to transverse your scene and ask your items, please let me build this data structure. This data structure contains all the information that the renderer needs in order to draw your elements. So if I have a rectangle, I'm going to contain some geometry, typically two triangles plus associated materials, shaders, colors, and so on. Only the visual representation. If I have something like text, it's much more complicated, but all of that gets encapsulated into that data structure. Uh, if you're curious, you can open Gamma Ray and inspect this uh, the scene graph inside Qtquick. For instance, what I have right here is a screenshot. Uh, what you, you may see over there in the, in the corner is that there is that uh, rounded rectangle uh, which is being analyzed. And uh, the analysis of that is showing that that rectangle is being realized by having this piece of geometry, which is a bunch of triangles with a little bit of border and so on, plus ancillary data. So this is geometry, but there is also material. There is also other stuff attached to it. Okay, this is the information that the renderer needs in order to render the scene. And this information gets stored inside this data structure. So what happens is that, uh, is this, once I've built this data structure, the Qtquick renderer can transverse the scene graph and render its contents using OpenGL. However, since the Qtquick renderer has some sort of global view over the scene graph, what it can actually do is optimize the rendering of the scene graph. Because since it has this kind of global view and the, the, data, the scene graph contains all the data which is required to render a scene, the renderer can uh, figure out that perhaps certain elements can be drawn together. Yep, and therefore issue better OpenGL comments. To give you an example, suppose I've got that scene on the left. I got a red rectangle, some green text, and a blue rectangle which is rotated. That's my cute quick scene, that's what I set up. What happens under the hood is that uh, those elements are going to generate a scene graph which looks like that. So for the, rect for the red rectangle, I'm going to use uh, some geometry plus some material, which means fill it with red. Uh, for the text, some different geometry because it's more complicated, some different material because I need to draw letters, uh, likely textures or ancillary data. And for the blue rectangle, it looks like the red rectangle, but it's, it's rotated, so it's also got a transformation on top. That's what the scene graph contains. What the renderer can do at that point is read all that information and figure out, hey, you know what? I got two rectangles in there. I think I can draw them together in one draw call. In order to do that, what I can do is, for instance, coalesce the two geometries into one bigger geometry. So just append the two geometries, pretty much set the material to be the solid fill, and draw both rectangles in one go. Yep. Then, okay, I'm done. Let me render the text, so switch to the text material, draw the text. This simple, if you want, uh, way of proceeding actually results in a drastic reduction of your draw calls. It's uh, not unusual to observe uh, one or two orders of magnitude reduction of draw calls because the Qt Quick renderer does this. Yep. So in order to maximize OpenGL performance, Qt Quick will try automatically to draw together elements that require the same OpenGL state. That's the trick. And how does this work in practice? In practice it works by merging together all the geometries of the elements that uh, require the same OpenGL state so you can draw them together because you don't have to switch state while drawing them. We call this process batching. 
Okay, it's the, it's the keyword that you have to look for. Uh, and if we want, we can visualize this in action. It is important to understand that pretty much when, when you run, cute, when you visualize batches, you are, uh, what you see is how many different draw calls I'm, I'm doing in order to render a scene. The more draw calls, the worse the performances, because it means I'm stopping the OpenGL pipeline very often, and that's bad for performance. So how can we visualize that? Once more, gamma ray, if you want to, or export environment variables. Let's see an example of this in action, or a few examples of this in action, because this is very important. How much time have I got? Okay, perfect. So let's see an example of this in action. What do I have here is a bunch of rectangles, right? <laughs> Six different rectangles, different shapes, different colors. How many draw calls I'm using to draw them? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, Actually, just one. Even though those are six different rectangles with different colors, the batching mechanism is able to draw them all in one go. And the way I can see that is by running gamma ray, attaching to it, which is this thing. OK, sorry, where is the application here? And then I switch into batches mode. Now, the thing you're going to see will look like this simply because they're rectangles, but uh, I'm going to explain what you're going to see in a second. It's this one here, yeah. So what you see here is a different visualization of the same scene. This visualization looks like this. You're going to see a different color for each draw call you're making. So the fact that you see all six rectangles drawn in the same green, it means all six have been drawn in the same draw call. Okay. So QtQuick was able to coalesce all their geometries in one bigger geometry and draw them all in one draw call. And this is great. This is exactly what we want to happen. Let me see another example of this in action. Uh, let me run this. Thank you. Okay. Now I've also got six rectangles. However, uh, the opacity of these rectangles is slightly different. There's this one right here, which is on the left, which is, I think, half transparent. This one down here is also half transparent. Okay. Now, since, these, since some of these require different OpenGL state, those cannot be merged with the others. Okay. So what I'm likely going to see now is a different number of draw calls because, of the, because the batcher cannot batch them because they require a different OpenGL state. Actually, before I run this, let me actually check if that's the case, but I'm pretty sure it is the case because I wrote this. Yeah, as you can see, there are different rectangles with different opacity values. So I can rerun this into gamma ray. Go back here, visualize batches. Sorry, where's the up? Yeah. And now you see something which looks more like a rainbow. <laughs> okay. So the way to interpret this is the usual. See how many different colors there are in there. The more colors, the worse your rendering performance are. Right. So what you can see right here is that, for instance, the top right and the bottom left rectangles actually got merged together in the same draw call because they get, I think they're both opaque same opacity. These two in the middle also have the same opacity, so in the same draw call, and then I got different draw calls for the top left and the bottom right. Okay, so my, the number of my draw calls now is increasing because my elements require different OpenGL state. Right. So when is batching applied exactly? How can Qt Quick figure this out semi-automatically? Uh, there isn't a, a hard rule, if you want, because this process is mostly a uh, heuristic. There is a trade-off in the sense that Qt Quick will try to batch, but not too much, because otherwise the time that it's going to spend trying to batch is going to be more than the time spending just drawing everything. So it just will try to batch up to a certain point. Uh, the rule of thumb is this, is that any change you have in terms of opacity, clipping, material, render target, is going to result in a different batch. That's kind of, again, a rule of thumb. You need to run the application in the batches visualization mode 
to figure out if that's the case or not. Also, sometimes uh, visual overlapping and transformations will take a role. And what do I mean by that is that if you have elements which are, for instance, uh, transparent, there is a difference between drawing them separate or drawing them one on top of each other. Because if you draw them separate, they can be drawn together. But if you move them in a way that they're overlapping, then you cannot draw them together anymore. You need to draw the back one and then the front one. Right? You, need, you need to perform alpha blending. <laughs> so also those things can take a role in how batching works. And wait a second, is this a real problem? I'm just making this one up. Uh, no, unfortunately, this is a real problem. <laughs> I've seen uh, so much code that tries to be clever, doing uh, fancy stuff in Qt Quick, uh, like applying too many transformations, opacity masks, and so on. Uh, and uh, that actually results in hundreds of draw calls. And usually, of course, somebody else is going to take the blame, like Qt Quick is terrible, or Linux is terrible, or Linux drivers are terrible, and so on. While instead, the way you have programmed your Qt Quick scene uh, cannot be helped, pretty much. Right? And uh, yes, this is a real thing. So uh, if you were at Mike's talk yesterday, oh gosh, let me see if I find the example again, sorry. What's going on here? Okay. Uh, do I have Quasar around? Probably, yeah. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm, I'm just finding an example of that, that I just made it up. OK, here we go. Oh, OK, sorry. Live coding, always fun. Yeah, OK, more or less. Uh, does it work? Probably, okay. Perhaps you have seen, uh, gosh, it's very dark. You have seen this thing from Mike's talk yesterday where I have this cute quick UI interface, right? There is a slider over here, there is a button over there and so on. What are those things? Those are uh, various rectangles with round borders. Uh, this one is half transparent over and half transparent over half transparent background and so on. And the thing is, this thing is pretty much unbatchable. So every single item in there results in a different draw call. Uh, slides, batches. Yeah. If you run this inside batches visualization, look at how many different colors are over there. This is pretty much all different, meaning that each and every of those elements gets drawn in a different draw call. And that's kind of the worst case scenario. You don't want to see that at all. Right? You'd like this thing to be one or two draw call stops. He said it's already seven, 10, 20. And actually, the full thing on the left takes more draw calls than to draw the car on the right side, the, the complex 3D car. So yes, this is a real problem. Uh, I can give you also another example coming from another project. It's not another project, another demo, uh, which is here. Yeah. So somebody, some time ago, built this fancy RPM visualization. And Qt Quick allows to build this very, very easily. Okay, I just apply a few transformations, a few shadow effects, and so on. Well, it turns out that this thing gets drawn in a, a huge number of draw calls for the same reason. All the elements have a slightly different opacity, a slightly different rotation. And if I touch gamma ray to it, and I switch visualize batches mode, this is another rainbow of colors. Yeah. Even the tick marks, the individual ones, are drawn in multiple draw calls. See? That's completely unbatched. OK. So how do I figure out how to improve this? Uh, I need to analyze my Qt-Quick scene and figure out what I'm doing wrong. Typically, stuff like I'm changing opacity all the time. right? And that means this thing cannot be batched together. OK, and I think I'm finished. I still have 10 minutes, so I would like to thank you. And if you have any questions, I'll please raise your hand. There is a microphone coming. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, does it make a difference when you have a rectangle and you have a transparent background color versus it having an opacity? Uh, say it again. What's the, uh, what's the stack? If you choose a color with an alpha channel versus uh -huh. 
giving the rectangle an opacity? Uh, it, generally, it does not make a difference too much because if you have a rectangle which is transparent uh, by means of opacity or it's transparent by means of color, it means it's a translucent thing, so it needs to be handled in a special way. Uh, and uh, it could actually make a difference uh, in terms of how batching gets applied, but that's what I meant when I said the batching is anoristic. So in both cases, that's going to worsen your performance because translucent items are problematic. They need to be drawn in a given order. When you have a translucent item, you must draw everything which is behind it first, then you need to draw that one, and then everything which is on top of it, right? So it needs to be drawn in a specific order in the global drawing order. Uh, I don't think that Qt Quick, actually I do think that Qt Quick is going to make a difference between opacity and the color, but because I know how it works internally, uh, if you're in doubt, run inside batches visualization, I'm pretty sure that changing opacity is better than changing the color because you can have other elements with the same opacity and they can be drawn together with that rectangle which has the same opacity. Whilst if you have a different color for that rectangle, then likely only that rectangle is could be drawn like alone. But that's probably a guess. It's me doing this and think, I think that's what happens because I know how these things works internally. Uh, do a test. For, for real, if you have this sort of doubt, do a test in batches visualization mode uh, and check if there is a difference. I expect there to be a difference. I could be wrong because, again, it's heuristics. This code is not, there's not a, an exact algorithm that guarantees batching or does not guarantee batching. It's mostly a series of tests uh, that uh, are hard coded somewhere inside Qt Quick uh, that sometimes will apply, sometimes will, will not. And the having, uh, Translucent things is one of the bad things in the sense that they break batching. Thank so, you. You're welcome. So thanks for the talk. Um, does the layering thing, the layering things convert to pixel, right? The layer things, yes. Okay. So does that mean that if my window size changes, it gets recalculated? Uh, what do you mean by window sides, though? Because it, the thing you cache is the element onto which you apply layer enabled. So yeah. that element yeah. size has to change. Yeah, OK. If the element follows the uh, stretches, let's say. Okay. Yeah, then yes, of course. OK. Yes. I mean, it's completely automatic in the sense that it's going to automatically apply a screenshot at the right resolution. Uh, the screenshot stays the same unless the element itself changes. That includes the element that changes the sides. Uh, so whether it changes on its own or because it's got a binding on the window sides or something like that, does not matter as long as uh, we're talking about the element itself changing. Is that OK? Or? OK, sorry. <laughs> Any other question? No, maybe not. We're done. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Yep.